Hi, my name is Sina Wu, and today I'll be presenting your pre my presentation on IoT network traffic analysis, opportunities and challenges for friends investigators. I'll be giving you a brief introduction on the topic, what motivated us to carry out this research, a detailed breakdown of the methodology we took, and a presentation of our results following the experiments. And finally, we talk about the tool developed that will aid an investigator in carrying out the analysis. So with the increasing number of RT devices and the potential evidence on them, it's become more and more important when working on criminal cases. When RT devices are involved in investigation, it's important to make a decision on how to collect evidence, such as to be collected from the memory or the network layer, where this work focuses on the latter approach. Typically, this involves examining the network traffic between the devices and the system it communicates with. So this is looking at all the communication channels of the IoT device, so such as the cloud and the mobile app, looking, for example, for unencrypted information. So what motivated us to carry out this research? So we wanted to understand what metadata in the network traffic can be used for forensic evidence. So there's been a significant amount of research on IT devices on network traffic from various angles, such as the security perspective. However, most existing research does not focus on the forensic implications. This helped us formulate four research questions. First research question is we wanted to investigate was, does a IoT device expose ports that allow an investigator to connect or access the device? Well, significant, well, previous research has shown that many IoT devices expose their remote ports, so such as using port 22, which is SSH. This would allow investigator to easily access and acquire the file system and obtain evidence for an investigation. So we set out to study if remote access was widely available or if this was limited to a subset of IoT devices. Our second research question was, do IoT devices use encryption when sending or receiving information from the cloud and their mobile app. It's often stated in previous research that the majority of IT devices encrypt their communication channels. This makes it very difficult to obtain any useful forensic traces. So we set out to investigate whether this assertion is correct, and if not, whether devices were more, whether certain devices were more prone to sending clear text data. Our third research question was, do IoT devices' mobile apps use encryption when sending or receiving information? So being able to observe the content between the mobile app and the cloud can be of friends interest. So even when encryption is used, we can use a proxy server to decrypt the HTTPS traffic. So we set out to investigate what content is sent between the IoT device mobile app and the cloud. Our last research question was to which countries do IoT device and mobile apps communicate or establish connections with? This would help provide an indicator of where data resides. So it's often highlighted in previous research that data is spread across many different countries. We also make the assumption that data from IT devices are either stored locally or in the same country or within the EU at least. So we want to investigate whether this is true. So we now give a detailed breakdown of our methodology. So for experiments, we use network traffic obtained from two sources for our data sets. Uh, data set one, this is network tra traffic collected from 17 IoT devices connected to our test bed. Data set two, this was an existing data set created by previous research where the authors used their data set to classify IoT devices traffic into various categories using machine learning. So whether this was a light bulb or a home assistant. They collected traffic from 28 IoT devices, such as cameras, switches and hubs. Uh, given the sheer amount of data they collected, we randomly selected only seven days from the data set and excluded any devices that overlapped with our experiments. This left us with 15 IoT devices. So once we merged the data sets together from data set one to two, this allowed us, this created 32 IoT devices we use for experiments. Uh, we, when selecting IoT devices, um, 17 IoT devices, we had selection criteria that it was from a variety of families. So we so it included hubs, camera switches, and smart, uh, smart speakers. So this was to ensure that different, we had different manufacturers as well. So it's, represented a sample of devices available on the market. Popularity, uh, we searched various popular outlets, Amazon, eBay, and we selected devices based on popularity, average customer rating and reviews. This was so, this was to ensure that we selected devices that were more likely to be used by the consumers. Also, we selected whether a device, when we, uh, compatibility with virtual assistants. So when looking at popular devices, we found that users fav often favoured devices compatible with Amazon Alexa, Amazon Alexa or Google Home Mini. So if we had a choice between the two particular devices, we chose the one that was compatible. 
Network traffic was collected from various communication channels in our IT environment. So we first carried out port scanning. We then collected network traffic from the three different communication channels of an IT environment. Uh, we then used a proxy server to examine uh, network traffic between a mobile app and the cloud to intercept HTTPS traffic. Finally, we established the location of the data. So to answer research question one, does an IoT device export expose um, that expose, expose ports that allow an investigator to connect or access the data or access the device? So the aim was this aim of this was to carry out port scans to identify which open ports, which then can allow an investigator to connect to the device. We used MMAP to do a quick scan for open ports. We then used appropriate software such as the browser to, uh, to open ports, uh, to, to access ports 80 and 443. We then used PuTTY uh, to access port 22. We found the results, uh, we found that the majority of devices use well known ports or proprietary ports. Uh, only one device um, allowed remote access. This was the Vera Hub, and this was port 22. Uh, the root pass was also written on the hub, so this allowed us easily to gain remote access. Um, we found the Victor cam and the OneSphere cam exposed a large number of TCP and UDP ports. This was in contrast to two other smart cameras, the Xiaomi and the Y cam, where all the ports were closed. Although from the, it's beneficial to have all the ports closed from a security perspective, but uh, obviously pre pre prevents an investigator gaining remote access. Uh, to acquire the file system using traditional forensic tools. So the network traffic analysis was divided into three parts, uh, whether the device used encryption, uh, uh, whether we could decrypt the network traffic using HTT proxy and uh, location of the data. As an initial step, when we uh, looked at uh, whether the device used encryption, we uh, manually analyzed all the network traffic in NetminerMiner and Wireshark. Uh, in Network Miner. We used the clear text dictionary to carry out a customized search. And in Wireshark, we carried out a string search on the network traffic of each device, searching for any device identifiers and personal information, such as names, emails, and passwords. Uh, to find an easy method to identify if traffic was unencrypted, we used, um, we used entropy tests, which is, uh, we use a tool called Ent, which uh, analyzes the packet payload um, to look for unencrypted uh, information. Um, so the test values runs between zero and eight. Uh, high entropy value indicates there's randomness in the payload, which is most likely encrypted. Anything closer to uh, zero, which is low entropy, there's is uh, I mean there's more likely to be clear text. Although there's no definite threshold, we set our threshold level to seven to avoid missing any encrypted traffic. We then set up the proxy server to intercept any traffic between a mobile and a cloud. Uh, we use the process of a fiddler and then mobile device, Android mobile device, and ran uh, intensive various interactions between device login and log off. In total, we examined 13 mobile apps. Um, we then manually analyzed the data in Fiddler. Uh, in terms of location of the data, we used, um, using the me metadata, we primarily focused on location of the connected cloud services. So we use, we developed a Python script to extract a destination IP address, host field, and number of bytes to that server from each device. We then use the destination IP address to identify the location um, using geo IP database and the host address using who is um, data to identify the IoT cloud infrastructure. The research question two, do IoT devices use encryption when sending and receiving information from the cloud and the mobile app? So we examined the unencrypted traffic for any evidence potentially useful for investigation. Uh, we found the majority of devices encrypted their network traffic. This was especially um, uh, between the mobile app and the cloud. Overall, we found nine devices use no encryption with the cloud or mobile app. Seven devices use no encryption between the device to cloud. Three devices use no encryption between the mobile app to device. Especially, specifically, the, the Xiaomi camera uh, communicated to the cloud using no encryption, and the D-Link camera communicated to the mobile app and clear text. While both did, these devices showed high entropy scores, uh, even though they, because they didn't use any encryption, we found that because the devices used video compression, it meant that the entropy test would fail on these devices, um, especially cameras. So we've also found that when a Xiaomi camera detected motion, it would send an unencrypted video, the MAC address and timestamp, 
Uh, this was also present in the mobile, um, in the D-Link camera when it was activated, when the mobile app was activated um, between the device and the mobile app during live streaming where partial JPEG images were present in the HTC header in clear text. Um, the Samsung camera also sent unencrypted HTTP post requests to the cloud that exposed unique identifiers such as the MAC address, username, serial number, timestamp, and other user-specific device names. The three devices manufactured by Withrings all sent clear text data through HTTP post requests. Uh, more specifically, the, the Withrings smart scales displayed considerable amount of user information. Um, weight, height, in, a host, in, in mainly in HTT post requests. So all this data is sensitive and helpful not just identifying the user, but also uh, their physical characteristics. So research question four, do IoT device applications use encryption when, uh, mobile applications use encryption when sending or receiving information? So the mobile app to cloud, um, this was the communication between the mobile app cloud and we found seven to 13 apps allowed a proxy connection where the rest used given certificate pinning. Uh, so what we found was when we opened the YCAM mobile app, it would send a list of URLs which contained the motion captured, the username, user ID and API key. We've also found some more unusual activity from the TP-Link camera. We opened the app, um, it would take a snapshot which included a timestamp and a URL link, URL link to the JPEG snapshots. No, we weren't actually able to control or disable this functionality. So from the same mobile app, we also captured HTTP GET request, which exposed the basic authentication field that contained a username and password to log in for the device. This was only encoded in Base64, so this can be quite easily decoded. Research question four, to which countries do the IoT devices and apps communicate uh, established connections, which can then give an indication where the data resides. This was to identify the destination that the data transverses. We found that overall, uh, 26 of the 32 devices terminated in the US as shown in this table. This is unexpected as the closest data Amazon data center obtained uh, data center to, to our test bed is in UK, is actually in Ireland. So this shows the flow of the traffic to the top 10 countries, the height of the bands correspond to the number of bytes set by each device. Overall, we found that 75% of these IoT devices sent data to multiple destinations. From an investigative point of view, this is interesting as multiple destinations and jurisdictions can potentially cause delays in gaining access and security in the data. Next, we examined the devices that contacted the most destinations. We found that the light bulb uh, one of the light bulb um, actually um, contacted over 28 destinations. Uh, when compared to other devices such as smart cams and smart, smart hubs, we found the light bulb had limited features. So it's surprising that it contacted that many destinations. So tool creation, uh, although our results can be found uh, using separate open source tools, it would require an investigator considerable time to actually manually extract the data. So constantly we um, uh, developed a tool called IoT Network Analyzer, which was developed in Python to automate the process. The tool has the following four main features. It has the entropy calculation, so it, it can identify all sessions that are in clear text using a Shannon, Shannon entropy test. It can locate the data by extracting the source and destination IP address. It can make the assumption of the geolocation, the usage of the SKU reports. So first, a list of Port is created with a total number of occurrences for each port. Uh, this list is then checked against a predefined list of 22 secure ports. Uh, finally, it can then extract, the tool uh, extracts any clear text information it finds in the network packets. So uh, this is just a quick demo of the prototype tool developed called IoT Network Analyzer. It's, we've using it to analyze a PCAP file captured from one of the IoT devices on our testbed. It has several capabilities. Um, one of them is command line interface, so that is a very interactive tool. Um, so first we have to load the PCAP file that you want to analyze. The user can then select uh, various parameters. So for example, the user selects G, which lists all of the IP address and the geolocation data. If, if, it, if the user wants to select E, it displays a list of the calculated entropy values 
And if the user selects CN, it lists all the connections between the source and destination. And if the command PO is used, it overviews of all the ports used and, and occurrences of that port. Finally, we carried the evaluation of the tool, the tool's four main features and the performance of the tool. We used five PCAP files that we knew had clear text data and five PCAP files with no clear text data. So testing entropy tests, uh, the entropy feature, we, ex we evaluated, we compared our results to a similar tool called ENT and they provided accurate, uh, identical results. Um, the location of data, uh, we used an external IP stack service for detection uh, called IP stack service for detection location and we compared it to two similar services IP2 location light and geo location two uh, which showed very little difference between the databases meaning any of these databases would be equally suitable uh, we tested the feature of the usage of secure ports to test the accuracy of this feature we compared the results to a similar tool called T shark and we showed both tools showed identical results in terms of clear text extraction, we evaluated, we compared our tool to Network Miner and uh, with our tool identifying the same key PCAP files, which contained the, the identical results. They both showed the same clear text information. Finally, we um, tested the performance of the tool with respect to processing speed, central processing unit and memory usage. Uh, the results from processing and PCAP of sizes ranged from 500 to 75,000 kilobytes are shown are shown and the results show that it takes around one second to six minutes. A CPU and memory evaluation shows that the tool is not resource intensive as it consumes only 60% uh, CPU and has a very small memory footprint. Finally, our conclusion. So out of the 70 devices, we found only one device with remote access and two smart cameras had closed all their ports. Um, we found the majority of devices encrypted the network traffic. Um, devices that sent data in clear text were mainly smart cameras and smart healthcare devices, uh, with smart healthcare devices exposing the most personal information useful for investigator to identify features of a person of interest. We found seven of the 13 mobile apps allowed a proxy connections. Unexpectedly, some of these apps, when opened, would take snapshots, which include timestamp and URL link to the JPEG snapshot. While the majority of data we found was sent to the US, despite our test bed being based in the UK and a second data set collected in Australia. Thank you for listening to my presentation.